And how do you think they uh, take that on board from, from adults? Because I guess sometimes students kind of glaze over and they hear adults saying really nice things, really encouraging things to them, but sometimes it doesn't resonate with them internally. You know, they, they, they'll consciously receive it, but they don't internalize it and then, and then act on it. Um, do you see that as a challenge? And if so, how do you, how do you overcome it at School 21? I definitely think that can be a challenge. Um, I think the way to create really great talk and for students to believe they should be able to speak is by creating authentic situations where their voice makes a difference. So actually me just giving feedback to a child on their talk could be useful if they're listening um, and if they can understand my feedback and take it on yep. board. What's super helpful is when you create those high stakes environments where the feedback is really authentic and makes a difference to something they're doing. So our students don't just work on these kind of we don't just set them a fake project in school, so yeah. design this event, that doesn't happen. Right. Um, we say to them, you know, work with this employer, work with this business down the road that need this actual thing to happen. So when they get feedback on their talk, when they're um, supported and given advice, that's not just coming from teachers as well, that's a mixed group of people sharing that feedback, it's their peers, it's the person who they're producing an outcome for, right. Right. and it's the teachers, but in the context of this needs to be better for this real thing to happen and be a really good version of itself. So yeah, definitely, I think authenticity and high stakes is what makes the difference to students taking on feedback. Brilliant, I think that's amazing. And uh, do you share that approach with other schools? Yes, we do. Um, we have, so but we kind of open source all our work on Oracy. We've set up a charity called Voice 21 that takes that out wow. um, to other schools, but we also invite people in to see our work. So I think last year we had about a thousand visiting teachers from across the world, um, and we love having people in to see what we do. I mean, it's not perfect, we're not the perfect version, we're a work in progress, but we think that our emphasis on, on um, the voice of young people is really important and is something that people can come and learn from. Well, wow, thank you. So um, I'm going to hand over quickly to Karma Ray. She'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the businesses that she does, and then I think she has a question for Ade. Hi everyone, my name is Karma Ray Hall, also known as Naaria. So I have, um, how many businesses do I have? I have four businesses. So my first one is my vegan chocolate spread, which is my first business. The second one is my YouTube channel, which is, um, one of the businesses that I'm still in the working process of. And then these are my two newest businesses. One is called Karma Ray's Crazy Slime Kit, which is a slime kit that I do, which provides all the ingredients and measurements and instructions to make slime. And also I've got a slime business, which I do with one of my best friends, best friends from school called Nora, and it's called n, &N Slime. Great, thank you. So, my question for Ade is, hi Ade, so um, how has the student voice been raised through podcasting? Uh, so at DebateMate, our aim is to give students the confidence to operate and function in a 21st century labour market. So uh, we think that if you can give students the confidence to, to learn and to critically and, uh, and work in a team and critically and creatively think, then students will be able to uh, to be confident and be effective when they leave school, and that's that's pretty much our our whole aim. And it's interesting, Julian, you said uh, you know you use entrepreneurship as a sort of vehicle for developing these skills, and in a in a similar way, what we do is we use debating to develop these skills. And so with our podcast, um, what we do is literally get students opinions on worlds, the world's issues, right? So, uh, the, funny enough, I was, when I started working on the Debate Made podcast, we were looking back through some of the old podcasts that we've done, and we found an old recording of me in about 2010 as a student, um, and I called in and I was giving my opinion on uh, the Syria, the, the war in Syria, and, and a, a big issue. Um, and what we do is we give students a license to put forward their opinion and uh, their, their arguments or thoughts on these big issues that they might have thought were removed or, or, or too uh, advanced for them. Um, and the way we do it, and the, the only way I was able to do that is through doing debate at school. And really the debating it isn't the, the, the end of, of what we do. Actually, the debating is just the vehicle by which we develop skills like communication, confidence, teamwork, creative thinking, critical thinking. So you can look at an argument and look at how to uh, examine the content of it and then also be able to 
empathize and think about how other stakeholders would operate. And so I was able to go on the podcast all those years ago at school uh, because I had been put in a room uh, with 15 minutes preparation and then had to debate, right? And it's actually, it's actually, if you, it's actually quite difficult. You know, and what, what it does is it allows students to think quickly and develop the skills so that they can uh, put their voice out. And then, you know, if, hopefully, if, they, if they're lucky enough, they can get on the Debate Make podcast and, uh, and give their, their opinion on a big issue that they might not otherwise have been given the airtime or license to, to give their opinion. And how old do you need to be to start podcasting? Uh, well, I don't think I'd put a, a minimum limit on that. So long as you had the ability to speak, I think <laughs> I, I think you're, you're definitely eligible to, to get on a podcast. And the, the key thing isn't necessarily your age, I'd say. What we think is the key thing is you are able to look at an argument, construct an argument, and have the empathy to look at how other people would look at your own argument. You know, how would they feel? How would they assess the options available to them? And if, if you are able to do that, if you're able to look at an issue uh, and have a structure to thinking, structure to argumentation, uh, then you, you can be on a podcast. It doesn't, your, your age isn't, isn't necessarily the key thing here, I'd say. It's the, the skills that are required in order to, to give an opinion. So my next question is for Debbie. Um, what can schools do to improve the platform for for the student voice. So for example, in my school, we can, whenever the senior man management has meetings, we have the opportunity to go in and shout our opinion. I think that's a fantastic way of doing it. I think what's really important though is that student voice doesn't happen with a self-selecting group. I think that often does happen in schools. That's a bit of a problem. So it might be that the people who go into those meetings are the ones who say, I'm happy to do it, I'm, you know, I'm confident to do that. Um, same as the people who go to debating clubs after school maybe, who opt in because they already have the confidence to take that first step or because they've got the parents who are saying you should take this first step. Um, so I think what schools can do are create platforms like that where students can influence decisions, but I'd say it has to be authentic. So what you say to those that senior leadership team, they have to take it really seriously. It can't just be that they're having you there as you know a development opportunity for you. It has to be for them to see it as really developmental for the school. But also that the group of students who are getting involved in that are varied and actually that it's comprehensive, that everybody has the opportunity to do that and not just the ones who are the most confident. So I think that's something that schools could be doing. I think another thing is they could be really thoughtful about how they plan talk in the classroom. So teachers you know, you go into any classroom, there's going to be an element of talk. They might say, turn around and talk to your partner. Um, they might say, okay, we're going to spend five minutes having a conversation about this thing that you're learning about. But actually, putting the thought into how they deliver that and how the groupings work and are there any protocols around the talk? Are there any agreements that that group of people are talking have amongst um, themselves before they start talking? I think are really important to developing voice. So, as an example, if the teacher put a group of students together and one of the rules was if somebody's not speaking, invite them into the conversation. That means that the student maybe who has less confidence to start talking themselves, if somebody else says to them, you know, Debbie, I haven't heard from you yet, do you have an opinion on this? They're given a platform to share their voice. So I think planning talk carefully, but also making sure it's not just a self-selecting group of students because you then just perpetuate the kind of social structures we have. It just means people who are already confident get to carry on being more confident. So my last question for Debbie is, uh, what would what would students what would students know about the value of their voices? What would they know? Yeah. Um, so I think students should know that they uh, deserve to have a platform. That their voices they are gonna you know they are the, the things that are gonna change the world. I mean we saw that picture earlier in that first talk of you know all the challenges we face in terms of climate change in terms of you know, countries working together and I think young people should know that their voices are key to solving those problems. Um, so yeah, for me it's about the power of change that they have and knowing that they deserve to be on a platform and deserve to share it. So I've spoken at many places, one of them is Bloomberg, uh, London Live, on the radio and many more events. So how do you think other students or children can get opportunities like that? Um, I think it's about those organisations creating opportunities and I think it's about schools 
um, taking them up on it. So the best way I think to make sure it's fair is it by going through schools. I think if it if it's just opportunities that are advertised that parents can put their children into, then you'll get the same kind of children who are going to them. So I think it's business, you know, the world of tech, the world of finance, the world of charities, whatever it might be, whatever areas of business working collaboratively with schools to get young people into those sort of situations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So a question for Ade and um, Hedera over there. Uh, do you guys see the value of the parents um, in raising the student voice? I mean, has there been any experiences where you've seen that have an impact? Because sometimes we kind of silo the, the experience of the young person. So, you know, their experience at school, their experience with friends, their experience with parents, but actually for that young person, it's, it's one experience. So how do you think we can bring parents more closely into the fold for something like podcasting, for example? Um, because I think it's a great platform, but you know, their input and their support at home is, is massive. So how do you see that input impacting the student voice? Yeah, well, I think, absolutely. I think uh, parents are uh, admittedly and obviously a massive influence on, on and a student's voice and their ability to advocate for themselves and so their ability to to add to feel a value in the things that they are saying but i think crucially the what we can control what what we can affect is uh, how students can engage uh, in society and how their voice can be received in society and in school uh, that that's that's where i see uh, the difference being made um, I, as in you know, you can't necessarily control for parents, where you, whereas you can control for an education system and the structures around it. Um, and so, I think where we can where we can control, that's where that's where we see importance. That's what we see as uh, as being the thing that is is most important for us. Um, and I think that the way we do that is by giving students the ability to advocate for themselves in any arena. And, and I think it's, it's I, I really agree with what, what Debbie says in the, the idea of accessibility. So we, we teach, at the Bayman, we teach debating uh, to students, 6,000 students every week uh, in schools across the country. Um, and students come to after school clubs. And if those clubs aren't accessible for all the students, and um, where they can work in a team with students who might be a bit higher ability than them, and learn from the students who are also in their team, where if the, the curriculum isn't one whereby you can use the skills that are being developed through debating in any subject, whether it be technical, science-based subjects, or more humanities-based subjects, we think, actually, if it isn't a general and, and uh, across-the-board effect, it isn't going to be as good of an effect. And I think we have to focus on the bits that we can control, which are to do with after school, after school clubs or the curriculum, the sort of in, in, in the box, the content, what is actually being taught, that's what we need to look at and, and you know, use that to give students as many skills as we can afford them. I don't know what you think, Ada. I think, um, like, building with, with... Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, so building what Ada said, I think it is very true that it, what, what, what parents are a very important factor in kids' life, they're a very big aspect of it. In terms of the ability of us to try and control what parents do is very limited. I think parents' role is generally to be supportive, to foster discussion, to allow their kids to have that kind of ability to speak. But in situations where that isn't possible, like the work we do um, at Debate Mate is kind of to give the children the confidence to build up their own voice, like take part in every opportunity we can give them. You know, we've worked with many different companies and businesses. Like in passing this, we had Goldman Sachs who offered an opportunity to some of our students to get involved, to get involved in pitching, get involved in the workshop there. And I think in that way, that is how we can change like children's ability to speak out and their confidence and their aspirations, things like that, through offering as many opportunities as we can. I think parents fall into that insofar as they can encourage their kids in the home, home and they can perhaps foster work. very much outside of that aspect, because you, it's not like our place to get involved in parenting. So I think a lot of the focus does fall on, you know, other external education, educational organisations. 
I'm glad actually Hayden brought that up. I completely forgot this event. So to, to explain, we we uh, we did an event with Goldman Sachs where we got loads of our students who come to our after school clubs to do uh, uh, exercise with um, analysts and members of staff where they analysed and looked at loads of uh, companies. And at the end, uh, they got they were given some guidance, chatted with some of the professionals, and then they had to pick you know like sort of real world scenario. Um, and at the uh, and what that was was giving them the confidence to stand up in front of a professional. And make a case, you know, and, and, and analyze the different aspects of it. Um, and so the things that you guys are saying about sort of the putting students in the in a real environment, completely subscribe to. It. I think that makes that makes uh, perfect sense, and we we try to do that as much as possible. So I think the elephant in the classroom sometimes is the fact that we have platforms like Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, which are giving students a voice. Um, but they're not necessarily curated or moderated by parents or by educators um, and it's completely low of the barrier to entry um, for those students and for those young people. Um, so firstly, Debbie, Schools 21, how do you approach that, you know, the phenomenon of uh, that, that social media has now enabled young people to, to give them a voice, to give them a voice in, in a really authentic way, how does School 21 potentially approach that conversation with, with your students? Okay, so I think there's two parts to it. So there's what they put out there and there's what's received as well. Um, in terms of what they put out there, I think what we can do is, like I said, teach them, we'll give them the skills to be able to speak out. And I mean speak out in all sorts of ways, whether that's creatively using their voices and words or using images or whatever. So it's supporting them with learning context, you know, tone, how does it work when you're in a small group, how does it work when you're projecting to a larger group, so a lot of that is a kind of taught part of our curriculum, we think about it really carefully um, and know that we teach them how it translates to different situations, whether it's online, whether it's um, in person, etc. Um, so that's a big part of it, but the other thing we do is we offer a programme called the Real World Learning Programme, so that's where our students go out of school, um, so those in year 10 and year 12 and for half a day a week, every single week, they're out of school and they're working for an organisation right. on a problem, which I sort of described before. And lots of those projects have um, had a social media element to them. So young people, so I mean, when we ask organisations, what do you want our young people to do for you? Lots of them say, social media, we're just not reaching out. We don't know what platforms to use. We don't know how to use them to make sure young people hear us. I mean, we, had, we did a project recently where students were um, looking at the um, hospitality industry which is going to be completely changed um, when we exit the EU because lots of our workers in the hospitality industry come from European countries within the EU um, there needs to be um, a change in that we need to get young British children wanting to go into those industries so this um, organisation we worked with and YouTube, Snapchat which are giving students a voice um, but they're not necessarily curated or moderated by parents or by educators um, and it's completely low of the barrier to entry um, for those students and for those young people. Um, so firstly, Debbie, Schools 21, how do you approach that, you know, the phenomenon of uh, that, that social media has now enabled young people to, to give them a voice, to give them a voice in, in a really authentic way? How does School 21 potentially approach that conversation with, with your students? Okay, so I think there's two parts to it, so there's what they put out there and there's what's received as well. Um, in terms of what they put out there, I think what we can do is, like I said, teach them, we'll give them the skills to be able to speak out, and I mean speak out in all sorts of ways, whether that's creatively using their voices and words or using images or whatever. So it's supporting them with learning context, you know, tone, how does it work when you're in a small group? How does it work when you're projecting to a larger group? So a lot of that is a kind of taught part of our curriculum. We think about it really carefully um, and know that we teach them how it translates to different situations, whether it's online, whether it's um, in person, etc. Um, so that's a big part of it. But the other thing we do is we offer a programme called the Real World Learning Programme. So that's where our students go out of school. Um, so those in year 10 and year 12, and for half a day a week, every single week, they're out of school and they're working for an organisation right. on a problem, which I sort of described before. And lots of those projects have um, had a social media element to them. So young people, so I mean, when we ask organisations, what do you want our young people to do for you? Lots of them say, social media, we're just not reaching out. We don't know what platforms to use. We don't know how to use them to make sure young people hear us. 
I mean, we had we did a project recently where students were um, looking at the um, hospitality industry, which is going to be completely changed um, when we exit the EU because lots of our workers in the hospitality industry come from European countries within the EU. Um, there needs to be um, a change in that. We need to get young British children wanting to go into those industries. So this um, organisation we worked with, an advertising agency, um, sorry, PR agency, we're working with big hotel groups like Hilton, um, and but the, they, the problem they identified was those big hotel groups just don't know how to talk to young people. So that was a particular project where our students completely um, kind of uh, changed the idea of social media for that organisation who were u previously using Twitter. They told them, you know, you need to be using Snapchat. This is the kind of tone you use. This is what young people are listening to, and they did that in order to um, reach a new audience. So part of it is actually saying to them. We embrace this. Here are projects where you can use your expertise in social media to affect businesses because you actually know more about it than they do. Um, and part of it is just having the conversation around how do you put your voice out there. Sure.